the 31st of December. The town was told to sort of be prepared and evacuate to this area here, the showground, because they didn't have the resources to protect too much of the area. It all sort of come to a head here on New Year's Eve. We, um, we were starting at 5.30 in the morning, just been a busy day. Uh, a couple of guys traveling from Maruya got to work and they said it's on its way. They could see the fire coming down the mountain. Um, I think the winds were about 60, 70 kilometers out at that stage, northwesterly, so it was blowing it straight towards Batemans Bay. Yeah, challenging time for the whole community, I guess. Um, the club had opened up for people to take refuge that um, needed somewhere to, for a bed for the night or to provide them with food and drinks and things like that. So I think you look at most clubs up and down the coast, um, you know, say clubs are community. I think that really proved the point where um, clubs are awesome in uh, opening their doors up to, to people that really needed it at that time. I guess there would have been three, 4,000 people here on the showground with, you know, camp with horses, dogs, goats, whatever they wanted to bring in. Yeah. Uh, I had probably 600 or 1,000 people camped up on the top of the hill there yeah. uh, on the golf course, which, you know, I didn't care at all. We had to protect people. Yeah. Clubhouse itself, it took a few other members that were evacuated from the houses at Browley and they slept in the clubhouse for a few days. And, we gave away meals in the clubhouse to volunteers and New Year's Day was just bedlam. I can't remember saying Happy New Year to anybody. We lost power quite regularly, like uh, we could go three days and then we'd lose it again. It might come on for a couple of hours and we'd lose it again. So every time there was uh, the power was on, I'd turn the irrigation on around the showground, trying to stop a ember attack. I think from memory, I put out 3.5 million litres in that sort of couple of day period when we did have power, yeah. just to try and protect for Ember attack. Like the, they had the three massive three, 737 planes and the helicopters. I think if they, they weren't here, I think it would have been a lot more damage. The dumping water, yeah, left, right, and centre. They were using this pond here as a as a pickup point and our irrigation dam as well. You can see the the trees there still quite charred. Obviously, we had no power on the course for six to eight days, so that meant no irrigation. The course was juiced up with a bit of moisture in preparation for something like that. So we got through pretty well um, when we got the pumps back online. We didn't lose any turf. We lost a little bit of turf on the back of this green. It's still recovering there where it burnt. And standing on zoysia grass here, over the back there, it, it turned yellow, but it's pretty bulletproof. It, it bounced back within a month, so. We were mowing. We were still trying to maintain the course at the same time. And just the smoke really I, I guess you shouldn't even been out there in it the members couldn't play in the smoke the people that lost their houses up in the, at the at the back i guess they were camped on the showground here for at least i'd say two to three months yeah some of them just living in tents so the town had no power no supermarkets no fuel you know there was probably 50 60 000 tourists still here uh, the backpackers that couldn't go anywhere due to COVID as well they were stuck here so they, uh, they looked after them here. We couldn't buy batteries, you couldn't buy bread, you couldn't buy milk. It was pretty horrific. We had one, one staff member who lives at Lake Conjola. He lost his home. So he sort of, he copped the full brunt of it up there and he, he's got quite a, a story, story to tell as well where he just got out. He's actually, I think his car, his tail lights melted on the way out. And you hear stories of, of, of some of the people at Lake Conjola where they left it too late to get out and they had to head back to the lake there and just drive straight cars straight into the lake and to avoid the to avoid the flames. You know, we stood here on the tailgate one day in my truck looking over there and you can see you thought it was eleven o'clock at night, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. The the colour of the golf course after the fires with the, the carbon and the ash, it was just a glowed, I reckon they would have seen it from Mars. I don't want to go through it again in a hurry. As as superintendents and turf managers we're pretty resilient anyway, so yeah, in that period golf didn't actually stop we we probably got busier like a lot of clubs did. No, we've got through it pretty well. The club survived pretty well, back up on its feet now. On when it's upwards from here, hopefully.